The legend of the merfolk is something I think we are all familiar with. It's a straightforward image, the torso of a human, usually a woman, mermaid, but with a fishtail as the bottom half. And the legend of mermaids isn't unique to one location. They appear in folklore from all over the world and are depicted in paintings and stories going back thousands of years. But are they just stories? Probably. But that hasn't stopped the sightings from ancient times up until recently. There are also photos, videos, alleged specimens, documentaries, and a variety of theories that try to suggest mermaids, or merfolk, are real. So today, that's what we're going to look at. Before we begin, big thank you to my patrons for their support, and thank you to Mr. In The Rough for the idea to make this video. This one's for you, pal. So where do we begin? Well, archaeologists have found accounts in Mesopotamian mythology of Ones, a male fish god from 5,000 years ago. Another early mermaid legend comes from Syria from 1000 BC, when the goddess Atargatis dove into a lake and decided to take the form of a fish. But the other gods didn't want her to give up her beauty, so only her bottom half became fish-like, and her top half kept its human form. Depictions of Atargatis have been found in ancient temples and on coins, it is often said that the first written account of mermaids comes from the Odyssey by Homer. At one point in the story, Odysseus has to sail past an island with sirens, and the sirens try to lure him in with their songs. Now, getting lured by sirens wasn't a good idea, as it says in the Odyssey, whoever draws too close, off guard, and catches the sirens' voices in the air. No sailing home for him. The thing is though, there isn't actually a physical description of the sirens in the story itself. However, ceramic paintings and tomb sculptures from the time depicted sirens as having the body of a bird and the head or face of a woman. It is generally believed that the sirens were more bird women than mermaids. But today the word siren and mermaid have become somewhat interchangeable and the idea of mermaids enticing people and leading them to their death has persisted. But so far we've only looked at more legends and myths. Let's look more into actual accounts and try to find something that resembles a mermaid more. For this, we can go to the first century AD, to Naturalist Historia, Natural History by Pliny the Elder. In Book 9, a book that covers marine animals, Pliny speaks of creatures called nerids that seem to somewhat resemble what we consider to be a mermaid, a creature that has scales but a human form. He reports that the ambassador of Gaul wrote that several lifeless nerids appeared on the shore. Pliny also tells us of a male version of the creature, perhaps a merman that would climb onto ships at night, and if he remained on the ship, it would sink. It is interesting to read about these nerids, but I guess the question is, how much stock should we put in Pliny's writings? Now, on one hand, he did sort of write about a very large squid, which turned out to be true, but he also wrote about some animals that have never been proven to exist, like the manticore. Some websites say that there are references to mermaids in scripture, but this isn't exactly correct. In the book of Samuel, there's a part about the Philistines going into the temple of Dagon, an idol. Now, while there doesn't seem to be a very detailed description of what Dagon looked like, some people think the word Dagon derives from the word dag, meaning fish, and that Dagon was half fish. The rabbi, David Kimshi Radek, sorry if I said that wrong, but he said that Dagon took the form of a merman. The quote is, Dagon had the form of a fish from the navel down, and the form of a man from the navel up. But even if this was what Dagon looked like, it wasn't a creature people saw, but an idol they had. I should also mention that some think it actually came from the Hebrew word dagon, meaning corn, and that it was actually an agricultural deity. Jumping forward in time again to the mid-13th century, we get an account of mermaids washing up on the shores of Greenland. In the book The King's Mirror, in a chapter about the creatures of the northern seas, we get descriptions of multiple types of whales and a mermaid creature. It is described as having the form of a woman from the waist upward and is said to have large hands and its fingers are not parted but bound together by a web like that which joins the toes of waterfowls. And of course, below the waistline it has the shape of a fish with scales and tail and fins. It is described as a rare animal. It quote, It rarely appears except before violent storms. There are even some descriptions of its behavior and that it will plunge into the waves and will reappear with fish in its hands. There is also the element of fear and superstition. Apparently, if the mermaid throws the fish at a ship, then there will be a great loss of life. 
I think the thing that intrigues me most about this description is the webbed hands. I don't know, it seems to make sense that a mermaid would have this feature, and if this is a complete fabrication, then it's a nice touch to the story. Now, one of the most famous accounts from history actually comes from Christopher Columbus. On January 9th, 1493, while sailing off the coast of the Dominican Republic, Columbus records that he saw not just one, but three mermaids. Let me read you a piece from a translated version of the journal. The Admiral, Columbus, went to Rio del Oro. He saw three mermaids, which rose well out of the sea, but they are not so beautiful as they are painted. Though, to some extent, they have the form of a human face, the Admiral says that he had seen some at other times in Guinea on the coast of Mancueta, and that's the entire section on mermaids. Today, almost every source you look at about Columbus's sighting will say he actually saw manatees. Well, he was definitely in an area that manatees inhabit, and the brief description does seem to me like they considered what they saw to just be a common animal in the area, and the, to some extent they have the form of a human face, does make them sound like something other than a mermaid. I've read that the other sighting off the coast of Guinea that is mentioned could be a dugong, a close relative of the manatee, but considering the range of a dugong, I think it's more likely to be an African manatee. Now, I know some might think it's hard to think of a manatee as a mermaid, but when all you have to go on is some paintings you've seen before, and the subject is in the water, who knows how far away, I think it sounds plausible. After all, Columbus is the king of misidentification. Let's move back to Europe specifically to the British Isles, where there seems to be a lot of mermaid sightings. The next account is from Wales in 1603. A farmer named Thomas Reynold spotted the creature and called others over to watch, and they apparently watched for three hours. The creature was described as a monstrous fish that appeared in the form of a woman from her waist upward. There was even a drawing created for the creature in a pamphlet in 1604. Now, I'm a little suspicious of this picture. Like, if we zoom in on the head, does that look like the head of a human to you? Because to me, it looks kind of like a seal, which is really strange to me. Like, why, if you wanted to draw a mermaid, would you give it such a seal-looking head? Now, maybe the artist drew this based on the descriptions, or maybe they took some creative license. And of course, there are a lot of seals around the British Isles. Now, with that account, there didn't seem to be any sense of fear or danger, but there was for our next sighting. Blackbeard, also known as Edward Teach or Thatch, was an English pirate who operated around the West Indies and the east coast of the North American colonies during the early 1700s. He had a fierce reputation and is probably one of, if not the, most famous pirates of all time. And according to some sources, Blackbeard often told his men to steer clear of certain waters as there were mermaids there and it was too dangerous. Now that sounds fairly ominous. However, the some sources I'm referring to are multiple websites. This is where all the tricks are. But they are all a bit vague on where they are getting their information from. And it kind of sounds like they're all just copying from each other. Now, one website said this was from Blackbeard's logbook. Cool. So I wanted to try and see if I could find a copy or an abstract from the book to see exactly what it said. But here's the thing. There is no evidence to suggest that Blackbeard kept a logbook of his pirate activities. It's fiction. We made it up. We made this one up. It's a made-up tale. While logbooks were common among sailors and pirates during this time period, Blackbeard was not known for keeping detailed records of his voyages or his exploits. It is possible that some of his crew members kept their own personal logs, but there is no definitive evidence of this. Now, in 2018, fragments of a book were recovered from the wreck of one of Blackbeard's ships, but it wasn't a logbook or any book written by Blackbeard or his crew. It was just a book they had for reading. I've read all of these. Many times. But then I read that Blackbeard had a sighting where a mermaid with green hair swam around his ship. And this allegedly came from a book called A General History of the Pirates by Captain Charles Johnson. This book was published in 1724. The book is available to view for free online, so I searched through it and couldn't find any mention of any mermaid sighting. So I thought, okay. Maybe this is just an abridged version or something. So I bought the book on Kindle and again searched for any mermaid sighting. And again, I didn't find any. I don't know where the story originally comes from, but it sounds more like a myth that someone may have made up and then a bunch of people jumped on it and started spreading it around without checking how legit it was. Wait, 
What about that quote I just used? Well, that also pops up on a variety of websites. But do you know where it originally came from? The 2011 film Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides. And while I'm on the topic, can I just say that in a lot of YouTube videos that show top 10 real mermaids caught on camera, they show footage of one of the mermaid props that was used in the movie. And it is a prop. You can even see the art team make it in the behind the scenes footage. And not only that, sometimes they use this actual behind the scenes footage as proof it's a real mermaid. They take a clip of it, they turn down the sound and say, here is a team of scientists with a mermaid body. Well, if we turn the sound back up, we can clearly hear they are the team who created the prop. We were given several designs. I think it was four total that we went from, from ILM. You know, you know, you can theorize about what these things should look like. For Deliberately misleading. I'm going to talk a little bit more about these videos later, but for now, please just realize this isn't a real mermaid. Moving on. We do have another sighting from the early 1700s, and we actually have a direct source. And this one isn't just a sighting. This account includes the capture of a mermaid. In 1719, a unique book was published by artist Samuel Fallor. The book was called Fishes, Crayfishes, and Crabs, and it was apparently the world's first color book of fish. Now Samuel described many different marine creatures, including a mermaid that he kept in a bathtub in his house for four days. Let me read you the piece. I had this siren alive for four days in my house at Ambon in a tub of water. My son brought it to me from Burrow. It died of hunger, not wishing to take any nourishment, neither fishes nor shellfishes, nor mosses or grasses. It did nothing but whimper with little cries that sounded somewhat like rats. I had the curiosity to lift its fins in front and in back, and it was shaped like a woman. So what's going on here? Well, maybe he really did have a mermaid in his house, but he makes some odd claims in this book. For example, he claimed that he caught a four-legged anglerfish on a beach. To quote the book, I kept it alive for three days in my house. It followed me everywhere with great familiarity, much like a little dog. It seems like he may have made up some fantastical things to help sell his book. Now, there are a larger number of mermaid sightings, but I want to fast forward a bit and try and get to some more recent sightings. So we're going to jump ahead to 1943, to the Kay Island sightings. The Kay Islands, sometimes called Kai Islands, are located in the southeastern part of the Maluka Islands of Indonesia. In 1943, some Japanese soldiers were stationed on a small, remote island in the Key Island chain, and they reported seeing some weird creatures in the water. The odd animals were described as looking similar to a human, but with a mouth like a carp, they stood approximately 150 centimeters tall, so about 4 foot 11 inches. Their skin was described as being pink, and they had spines on their heads, and also, they didn't have the classic mermaid fishtail, but rather, two legs. They were seen in lagoons, on beaches, and sometimes swimming next to the beach. Now, while the Japanese soldiers didn't know what these creatures were, the locals apparently did, they called them the Orang Ikan. Now, in Malay, Orang means human, and Ikan means fish. They also told the Japanese soldiers that they sometimes catch the creatures in nets, and the next time they caught one, they'd inform the soldiers. And they did. One evening, Sergeant Taro Horiba was summoned by the chief of a nearby village. Apparently, an orang ikan had been found dead on a beach earlier. The sergeant went to the home of the chief and was shocked at what he saw. He described the dead creature as 160 centimeters long and possessing a head of red-brown, shoulder-length hair and spines along the neck. The face was said to be quite ugly, with human-like and ape-like features a low, short nose, a broad forehead, and small ears. The creature's fingers and toes were long and webbed. On returning to Japan, Mr. Horiba tried to tell zoologists about the creature and urged them to go investigate, but they wouldn't believe him. And since he didn't have a photo, no one took his sighting seriously. Now, two things about this. Firstly, throughout this video, I've tried to be careful with sources. And just to be perfectly honest, Though this story is on multiple websites online, I can't find a primary source, so take that with a wheelbarrow of salt. I will say I don't really get if this story is accurate, why they didn't take a photo, or better yet, take the carcass, or a piece of it back even. And even if they didn't have any physical evidence, 
Wouldn't the word of a sergeant in the military be taken somewhat seriously? At least enough to spike the curiosity of one zoologist in the 1940s? The second thing is, again, if we take the story at face value, is this really a mermaid? I've included the story because it is mentioned in a lot of articles on mermaid sightings, but I think we're dealing with a different cryptid altogether here. Orang Ikan sounds like a different animal. Now, while we don't have a photo for this sighting, our next two sightings do come with photos. On June of 1967, a mermaid was spotted on Main Island in British Columbia. The mermaid was spotted by a few passengers on a ferry. A newspaper called The Colonist reported, Several witnesses said the mermaid had a large fish, apparently coho salmon, and one swore she had taken a bite out of it. Long silver blonde hair and a topless condition were generally agreed upon. Now, a passenger on the ferry took a photo of the mermaid. It's not the clearest picture, but you can tell there is definitely someone there. A reward of $25,000 was announced as a reward for the mermaid, but she was never caught. Now, maybe this is a mermaid, but it seems like something that would be pretty easy to hoax. I mean, just have a woman sitting with a mermaid costume on a beach and there you go. Perhaps if they had seen her swimming through the water, it would have been more impressive. However, our next sighting from 1998 has just that. The sighting has been referred to as the Kauai Point Mermaid. The sighting was made by multiple people on a dive boat off the coast of Hawaii. The mermaid was described as having, quote, long flowing hair on one of the most beautiful faces I've ever seen. She was apparently swimming with a group of dolphins, even keeping up with them. Quote, but there is no way a human being could be swimming so fast. She was keeping right up with the dolphins, end quote. She even leapt into the air at one point, revealing her scales. Then she dove beneath the surface and disappeared. But about an hour later, while the group was diving, she returned and Jeff Liker took two photos. So looking at the photos, I don't think this is a manatee. In fact, I think it can only be two things. Either it's a mermaid or it's a hoax. If it really is a mermaid, it's a shame we don't have video or even an image of it swimming with the dolphins, because I don't think a human could keep up with the dolphins. But this image, I mean, it looks to be the right shape, but the subject being in shadow doesn't help the case, especially since there are many videos of performers being mermaids. It doesn't seem too impossible that this could be a person. There is a thread on the subreddit r slash cryptozoology where people discuss the photo and it seems people seem skeptical. The OP even provided a link to a documentary where the images might have been taken from. The images are similar but still a little different. But again, if an image was created for this show, maybe the image was created here too. Have the images been tested? Apparently yes. They were quote, analyzed by three noted photography labs. All three say the photos are genuine and have not been tampered with. But again, I think you can maybe stage an image in real life without needing any post photo manipulation or Photoshop. But let's back up a bit. How do I know the photos have been analyzed? And where am I getting all these quotes from? Well, the website Jack's Diving Locker has a newspaper article that contains all the information. But what newspaper? Well, a newspaper by the name of Weekly World News. And they publish stories like Airlines to offer outdoor seating. New York Times reporter eaten alive by 80-foot dinosaur. Easter Bunny Union cancels Easter deliveries. Five ways to protect yourself from leprechaun shenanigans on St. Patrick's Day. Cavemen invented the smartphone, etc. Weekly World News is a tabloid sort of spoof newspaper that publishes mostly fictional stories. So, I'm a bit skeptical. Now, maybe it just so happened that this is a real story and the newspaper actually covered a real story for a change and the shadowed figure really is a mermaid or are mermaids if there's two, but I don't think that's very likely. Let's move forward again to 2009, where we have some mermaid sightings from Israel. There were apparently multiple sightings off of the coast of a town called Kiryat Yam. Apparently, over a period of a few months, there were dozens of sightings. She was only seen in the evenings around sunset, and she would jump out of the water and perform tricks, and then she disappeared beneath the water. The town council offered a million dollar reward for anyone who could capture a photo of the creature, but no photo was ever produced. Now, if you search Mermaid Israel 2009, you will get this video, but this isn't a real video. It's from the Animal Planet fake documentary Mermaids the Body Found. Actually, the sequel, Mermaids the New Evidence. Now, we'll take a closer look at these shows in a minute, but for now, just know, despite the efforts of Animal Planet and some YouTubers, this isn't a real video. Now, since no image or evidence has ever been produced, some have claimed that the town council may have used the million dollar reward 
as a publicity stunt. Now, they denied this, but said they did think it could bring in more tourists. So, if it was a publicity stunt, it was actually kind of clever, though. I mean, getting a bunch of people to show up for a million dollar reward. It's enticing to think you could earn a million dollars, and if not, Carry it yam seems like a nice place. What's the harm? If the mermaid is real, it's not going to hurt you, right? Well, in some places, it seems that mermaids do hurt people. For the next segment, we're going to talk about mermaids in Zimbabwe. Now, you might be saying, wait, Zimbabwe is a landlocked country. And you, of course, would be right. However, many mermaid sightings and stories come from freshwater areas, and Zimbabwe is one of them. It seems that mermaids have a strong presence in the folklore of Zimbabwe, but not just in folklore. In 2012, attempts to install pumps for irrigation at a dam near the city of Mutare came to a halt. Why? Mermaid sightings. Mermaids are not considered to be friendly there. It is said that they kidnap, torture, and even kill people. So I guess I could see why the dam workers didn't want to get involved. I think it might be important to note that, from what I've read, mermaids aren't really considered to be an animal though, but more of a spirit or supernatural entity. When the workers refused to work on the dam, the local government hired a traditional healer to cast the mermaids out. Mermaids are considered by some to have demonic powers. There is an interview from a pastor from Zimbabwe by the name of Tugare Mapingre, and he believes that mermaids are real and classifies them as a demonic force. He said, If you show any sign of disgust, the mermaids won't be happy with your ancestors, and you could be killed. Now, the dam did get up and running again after traditional healers brewed beer to appease the water spirits. Now, of course, many are skeptical. The water minister, Samuel Sipepa Nkomo, said, I do not believe in mermaids, but the community that lives in the area does. And the workers did see something, right? Well, maybe. It depends on what version of the story you read. Some accounts say they saw creatures in the water, and that's what freaked them out. But other accounts say it wasn't any sighting, but the fact that machines were breaking down mysteriously that made them think mermaids were about. I'm not sure exactly how supernatural the Zimbabwe mermaids are supposed to be, but it seems they are attached to superstition, so I don't know if anyone could find physical creatures around that dam. Unfortunately, we don't have any images or video. I mean, I did find this video, but... We do have another interesting video that popped up recently of what looks like a mermaid stranded on a beach. Now, details around this video are a little hazy. A TikTok version said the video was filmed in South Africa but a longer YouTube version said it was from Kenya. Authorities from both Kenya and South Africa have said they didn't have any reports of a mermaid washing up on a beach and suggest it could be a hoax. And there are some telltale signs. It seems the girl is wearing some kind of a wig, but the most obvious thing is the waist that separates the human part to the fish part. There is just a very odd texture in between, and if you look closely, when the girl breathes in, you can see a gap in between the human and the fish part. Probably a hoax, or perhaps an art project or something. Fairly well done, to be honest, but not convincing. On the topic of hoaxes, I guess we should quickly take a look at the Fiji mermaid presented by P.T. Barnum. Now, I'm sure that many of you already know that this specimen was a hoax, an ape torso sewn to a fishtail. Now, you might be wondering where it originally came from, and it seems it most likely came from Japan, possibly created by a Japanese fisherman. As a side note, I will say there is plenty of mermaid lore from Japan, which I guess translates as human fish, appears in a variety of Japanese literature. Like Zimbabwe, the earliest versions of the Ningyo were described as living in freshwater, some have speculated that this came from people seeing the giant Japanese salamander. Having seen some giant Japanese salamander myself, I'm not really sure how you'd mistake it for a mermaid, but you never know. Though the early Ningyo came from freshwater, later they seemed to mostly come from the ocean. Now, you could honestly make an entire video just about the Ningyo, but for now, I just want to focus on the manufactured Ningyo. Manufactured? Well, some were being created using fish parts and ape parts, and they were held in certain temples. Perhaps the Fiji mermaid started out as a temple relic, or perhaps it was just a practical joke. It was probably sold to a Dutch merchant during the 1810s. At the time, the Dutch were the only Westerners who were allowed to trade with Japan. As a quick note, when Matthew Perry opened trade between Japan and the Western world in 1853, many more fake mermaids appeared on the scene. 
but let's get back to the Fiji mermaid. After it was sold to the Dutch, it passed hands a few times, and in the early 1840s, Moses Kimball, proprietor of the Boston Museum, bought the mermaid and showed it to his friend, P.T. Barnum, in New York City. P.T. Barnum had recently bought a museum in the city, and the two came up with a little plan. And by the way, under previous owners, the mermaid had been examined by naturalists and shown to have been a hoax, so I think they both knew it wasn't real. They displayed the mermaid at the New York City Concert Hall. They even paid fake naturalists to give fake lectures. Lectures stating that all land-dwelling animals have counterparts in the ocean. Sea horses, sea lions, etc. So it only followed that sea humans would exist. At the time, new animals from around the world were being discovered, so... Another trick that was used was that a platypus was put on display too. Oh, you think the mermaid looks fake? Just look at how odd the platypus looks, and it's real. Who knows what's out there? If only they knew about the coelacanth. After about a week at the New York Concert Hall, P.T. Barnum was able to display his mermaid at the American Museum, and museum attendance tripled. Now I've seen some videos from the P.T. Barnum Museum, and they said it wasn't a hoax, but rather a humbug. And I guess the distinction is it's just for fun, or to make people think or something. I mean, at least this was in the 1800s. Nothing like this would happen in modern times, right? Before he gets there, he's almost in range. That's metal moon. Very bad feeling about this. Then the ship around. Yeah, I think you're right. We'll reverse. Chewie lock in the artillery power. So firstly, I thanked Mr. in the Rough for the idea for this video, but I would just like to thank everyone else who suggested that I talk about the Animal Planet show, Mermaids the Body Found, and Mermaids the New Evidence. The first show aired in 2011 and tells the story of government cover-ups with regards to mermaids. The show is a mockumentary. It's fake. Like I said with previous fake documentaries, you can look it up on IMDb and see how all the doctors are actors. You can even see the VFX team who worked on the show and did the original creature design. The sequel was released a few years later, and it's kind of like an extended interview with clips interspersed. Again, it's not real, but they sneak in a few real things. Like they throw in a real CNN report from 2009 about the Kiryat Yam mermaid sightings in Israel. But then they play a fabricated video of two men supposedly videotaping a mermaid. How do we know this clip is fake? Well, people from the area have said it looks nothing like Kiryat Yam. I've never been, so I can't say for certain, but looking at photos and videos and flying around on Google Earth, I can't find a place that looks similar. Secondly, and I don't mean to be mean, but the acting leaves a little to be desired. Thirdly, at the end of the episode, there are credits that say VFX done by Bandido VFX. If we go to their website, we see that they have a section for mermaids by Discovery. Animal Planet is owned by Discovery. And if we click on the section, we can go through a show reel of the VFX they did for the show, including the Kiryat Yam mermaid. Around the time the show came out, many people seemed to believe it was real. And since the actors were pretending to be scientists working for Noah, the real Noah got a bunch of calls asking them about the creature, so they had to put out a statement. No evidence of aquatic humanoids has ever been found. In the show, they try and push the aquatic ape theory, which, when I originally watched the show, I thought Animal Planet had made this up themselves. But apparently it was popularized in the 70s and 80s by writer Elaine Morgan. Though you could actually trace it back to Alistair Hardy in the 1960s. Now, you could legit make an entire video about the AAT, but let's just summarize. Okay, so what is the theory? Well, it proposes that at some point in human evolutionary history, our ancestors underwent a semi-aquatic phase that influenced our anatomical and behavioral traits. Now, notice I didn't say our ancestors developed fish tails and lived in the ocean. Now, proponents of AAT will say that our lack of body hair, subcutaneous fat, and ability to hold our breath are all proof of AAT. But there are other explanations such as hairlessness for efficient sweating. Subcutaneous fat has a variety of uses. It's padding for our muscles and bones when we fall. It helps our blood vessels and nerves get from our skin to 
our muscles, and it can help control body temperature, making sure we don't get too hot or too cold. And other mammals also have the ability to hold their breath. The other thing is that the scientific community largely disregard the theory due to the lack of any evidence. There aren't any fossils that point towards AAT. Now I know the consensus of the scientific community doesn't mean much to some people, but there you go. And again, the theory isn't even that our ancestors evolved into mermaids, and then into humans or whatever nonsense Animal Planet is trying to push. They also show these cave paintings in one scene that are supposed to show people hunting mermaids. I don't know what cave this is supposed to be as they only say somewhere in Egypt, but since I can't find this anywhere else except for when people post screenshots from the mockumentary, I'm not sure that these are real paintings. I have found other paintings that seem to show possible mermaid-like creatures, though some say they aren't mermaids. But again, is a painting really evidence? Is it not possible that some of our ancestors used a bit of imagination when creating art? The thing about this nonsense though, I mean this made up fake documentary, is it set a new ratings record for Animal Planet and brought in 3.5 million viewers. The record was passed the next year when Mermaids The New Evidence passed 3.6 million viewers. And then the floodgates were open. Discovery Channel, who owns Animal Planet, realized if they wanted to get the views, they should just make stuff up and pretend it's real. Megalodon, The Monster Shark Lives, passed 5 million views. And I bet their other fake shows did pretty well too. Isn't it a bit sad? Nearly 180 years later, institutions that are supposed to educate us, to spread some truth and shine some light on the wonderful parts of the world, would rather deliberately mislead us, sliding in some reality to confuse us, paying actors to pretend to be scientists to convince us? And the response is, well, it's just for fun. And the thing is, the fake shows are just the tip of the iceberg. Like with the Megalodon shows, clips from mermaid shows are thrown up on YouTube, and if you read some of the top comments, it's not encouraging. That shot with the CGI mermaid on the rock in Kiryat Yam was uploaded as a standalone YouTube video by someone, and the top rated comments are, they can be real, it is a 95% chance, we have only discovered 5% of the ocean, and the deeper it gets, the more mysterious it gets. And after seven years of watching this, I have come to realize that that is a real mermaid. I mean, in seven years, you could have looked into it a bit more. It didn't take me seven years to find out it was created by Bandido VFX. And regarding the first comment, I'm so sick of the 95% unexplored or undiscovered, as this commenter said. The thing is, it's very difficult to even define what explored means when it comes to the ocean. Are you talking about how much of the seafloor has been mapped at high resolution? The last time I talked about this, I said it was about 20%, and that the team Seabed 2020 were working on getting it to 100% and they have been working on it. As of June 2022, it was about 23.4%, and probably a little higher today. Again, the plan is to get to 100% in the decade. Okay, so 75% unexplored? Well, again, how are we even defining this? We have satellite maps of the entire ocean, but do people have to have been there? Do they have to swim around in a particular part? And if so, isn't the water and all the creatures in it moving around? I don't know. Again, a really great video by an actual marine biologist broke this down really well, so I'll link that in the description, and I highly recommend you watch that after this video. And there are also many other this is definitely real comments too. And then there are those top 10 videos. You know the ones. I've tried to parody them before. The ones that start by saying if you don't subscribe, a tarantula will crawl on your face, and if you hit like, you'll get 10 years of good luck. And like I said, they will often have the Pirates of the Caribbean prop in them, but also, most of their list is made up of clips from these fake mermaid shows. They all seem to forget to mention in the videos, though, that they're taking clips from the Animal Planet show and act like they are unrelated videos. It's fiction. It's a made-up tale. We made this one up. It's a total fabrication. This one was invented by a writer. It never happened. It never happened. We made this one up. And I mean, they must know they are fake. And if not, they put little to no effort into researching it and they get millions of views. Now you might say, oh, you're just jealous. And yeah, of course I am. Who wouldn't want all them views? But it's also just sad. Look, I love cryptozoology, but this is just lazy nothing. They want you to subscribe and hit that notification bell to get notified about whatever trash they vomit onto YouTube next. Just gotta keep praying to AVNJ to roast these videos. And you know, if you wanna see some fascinating cryptozoology videos, I'd like to recommend Truth is Scarier Than Fiction. His content is really great. He covers many interesting topics related to cryptozoology, and he actually takes a really level-headed and logical approach, and he actually puts in the work to do the research. 
I mean, his video on the coelacanth was just great. Chef's kiss. Perfect. I still get comments about the coelacanth every few days. Now, to be honest, if anyone comments that under this video, I'm just going to respond by linking his video. But yeah, very underrated creator, and if you subscribe to him, I can't guarantee 10 years of good luck, but at least he has good videos. Now, I know I haven't been very warmed up to the idea of mermaids existing in this video. I just think there really isn't any good evidence to suggest that they are out there. But then, why are they so universal? Why do mermaid accounts come from all over the world? It is an interesting question. Even on Noah's website, they acknowledge the phenomenon. Why then do they occupy the collective unconscious of nearly all seafaring peoples? That's a question best left to historians, philosophers, and anthropologists. And maybe it's not for me to say, but I do have a theory. The thing is, it kind of reminds me of ghosts. Now, bear with me. See, I don't really believe in ghosts. And a few years ago, when I told one of my friends this, they got pretty angry, and she said, of course they're real. Why else would they appear in every culture all around the world? Well, I think it actually makes sense that phenomena like these aren't limited by borders. I think some feelings are universal among humans. The unfortunate thing about life is that we all, most likely, will lose someone we care about, regardless of culture or borders. And doesn't it make sense that yearning for lost loved ones often leads people to perceive their presence? Or in some cases, we may even perceive someone who died really tragically, even if we didn't know them. The thing about mermaid sightings is a lot of them happened during a time where sailors were predominantly men. And sure, there are some mermen sightings, but it mostly seems to be mermaids. Perhaps they missed a feminine presence. And maybe if you stare into the blurry, inky ocean for long enough, you see what you want to see. And maybe that's a mermaid. Perhaps these mermaids became a symbol of the cherished relationships left behind. Mothers, sisters, wives, girlfriends, or just friends. And perhaps it makes sense that there is a darker edge to mermaid and ghost stories. Remembering those who have gone, or missing those we left behind is okay sometimes. Probably healthy in moderation, but perhaps legends and cautionary tales about mermaids may have arisen as a means to prevent sailors from being consumed by their longing, just as ghost stories often carry warnings against becoming trapped in the depths of grief. Tales of treacherous mermaids might have served as a reminder to sailors of the dangers that lie beneath the surface. These stories cautioned against allowing desires and yearnings to lead one astray, potentially leading to a perilous fate in the vast and unforgiving ocean. Sometimes the abyss stares back. Thank you so much if you made it to this part of the video. I just wanted to mention that I'm going to move the podcast to a completely different channel. I realize it's not for everyone, so I won't be posting it here anymore. If you are interested in listening to my mumbly, monotone voice talk about more cryptozoology and animals, then there is a link below. I do have a co-host, and she is much more upbeat and educated, I guess. Thanks again to Mr. In The Rough. Thank you so much to my patrons, and thank you for watching. This is the part where I ask you to like and sub, but if you have a daily limit on subbing or liking, then I highly recommend you go check out some of the other channels I mentioned in the description below. They really deserve the views and the subs and the likes, so save it for them. Anyway, thanks again for watching, and I hope you have a great day.